Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. On this week's episode, we welcome Peter Haas, Associate Partner at Mavericks Private Equity, to discuss raising capital in turbulent times and how, as a founder, you need to protect yourselves from getting screwed. Peter shares his journey on how he got started working in the investment and venture capital ecosystem, first at Omer's Growth Equity, and then over to the family office of Peter Gilligan's Mattamy Homes. Next, we dig into Peter's recently published blog post on how founders should protect themselves from getting screwed by investors in turbulent times, and we cover all the different structures that investors put into term sheets to try and squeeze as much as they can out of founders during these markets. Peter walks us through examples on what kind of preferred shares, participating and non-participating preferred share classes investors need to be aware of, and why founders need to understand the difference between pre- and post-money valuations, as well as employee stock option plans when considering all the terms included in a term sheet. Lastly, we get Peter to share his recommendation for founders on how to negotiate a term sheet with investors and what his firm is looking at investing in at Mavericks these days and how they're treating founders during turbulent times. But before we jump into this week's interview, we welcome back to the tank an old guest of the pod, Anthony Mushantif, to discuss the news and stories making headlines in the tech and venture capital ecosystem. Well, thanks for joining us in the tank today, Anthony. It's uh, great to have you back, this time as a news rundown. We've been doing these sec- uh, segments with John Ruffalo, and they've been uh, well received by our audience. So we figured we'd change it up a little bit and have another Canadian venture ecosystem player join us. So thanks for taking the time to join us today, Anthony. Yeah, thanks a lot. And those are incredibly big shoes to fill. Anytime my name's said in the same sentence as, as John's, it's very helpful. Well, you know John well, so I'm sure you mm-hmm. understand how much you're living up to, but we'll try our best here. You know, one of the things that I wanted to get your thoughts on, Anthony, was just sort of how much we've sort of tried to transition our workforce back into the office. We saw a lot of the you know bank CEOs com- commenting on their earnings this week and about how we're trying to get people back together, but it's still not really working. And it's starting to affect productivity and talent development uh, and just building culture uh, in organizations. So I'm wondering you know, how you're thinking about it in terms of how you've seen the changes and what you think people need to realize the benefits are of being back together and whether or not we'll actually see that. Listen, my view is that it's largely situational and, and frankly categorical, right? So in, in other words, it depends on, on context. My view is, and, and my colleagues know this, like I was probably the most reticent about going back into the office wholesale. And I've honestly reviewed my thoughts on that. Like I think it's really important for teams to be in the office together for extended periods of time. And the reality is it's just a different way of working. You don't have the same... You just don't have the same collaboration and spontaneity that you have when you're sitting within a stone's throw of each other, where you can just kind of grab people and have a conversation. And I think that's really important. It's particularly impo- important for for young folks and people who are starting off in a new in a new job to be, you know, around others and you know to be able to engage sort of ad hoc. So I think it's really really important. It's really important for you know building community, building culture. Now, that being said, you know, I think hybrid work is likely here to stay. And I think, you know, individuals have proven out that they can, you know, frankly, maintain productivity. I don't know what the, you know, longitudinal studies will say on on longer term productivity, but they're able to maintain productivity in a kind of acute setting in a kind of 100% remote context. So with that being said, I think there's, there's, you know, there are benefits to both. And I think a hybrid work model is probably the optimal one to kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah, for sure. And, and we've been seeing it too with some of our younger employees who this is their first career job and, and they need to be around people who uh, they can learn from on a constant basis and ask those you know dumb questions to without feeling stupid for putting them in, in an email or in a Slack channel for everyone else to see. And that's important for us to recognize that learning curve needs to be relevant for them in person rather than just you know in a hybrid role. So totally agree with that. It's just interesting to hear you know some of the largest CEOs of our our corporations in the country still talking about this several years after the pandemic. Uh, so you're right. Well, we won't know the impacts of this for for probably another five, 10 years, to be honest with you. You know, one of the other things that happened this week that was kind of shocking to hear is that Indigo Books was hacked by some cyber hackers uh, t- with ties to Russia. Uh, they said they weren't going to pay the ransom, but they did have to quickly spin up a cloud uh, environment for themselves on Shopify to keep their business operational. You know, what do you think this means where how many uh, legacy organizations are still on-prem and how many have not switched to the cloud? Like, what does this mean for cloud 
what does this mean for cybersecurity companies and how it impacts you know the way startups are thinking about servicing a lot of these legacy corporations? Super interesting. So our team actually pulled up some interesting data about this because it's so topical. And what, what I think is lost on a lot of people is that the cloud transition is still happening. Right. Like there's still a lot of potential in cloud, like some of the you know data we're looking at here, like as of the end of 2021, I think it's 25 percent of application workloads reside in the pub- in a public cloud right now. Just over 25 percent of application workloads reside in a public cloud. More than half are still on prem, which is counterintuitive. Right. I think especially for us kind of in the industry that we we live and breathe, super counterintuitive, not something I would have thought now. That transition is continuing to happen, obviously, and I think you know that migration will continue to happen. But we're still reasonably early days in in cloud, and obviously that's going to you know introduce a whole host of new sort of security issues and, and and concerns. And what's interesting is you know cyber, I think as a as an investment theme and investment area is going to continue to be really really interesting, and in this context too, particularly resistant to kind of economic fluctuations because that's you know that's the last thing that tech executives will cut is cybersecurity. That's the kind of be all end all primary focus of, you know, maintaining customer data. Yeah, it's interesting. We've got some like cybersecurity investments. We also have some healthcare investments. Obviously, we invest in, you know, B2B enterprise SaaS. We understand the sort of trade-off between on-prem and in the cloud. But it's interesting how people think like, you know, ChatGPT will be the silver bullet that fixes all problems for organizations. But you have to realize, like, no enterprise is just going to allow ChatGPT and its APIs to be embedded into their on-prem environments or even in their cloud environments to have access to all of their data. And that creates almost a moat for startups who can make the leap into their ecosystems and to be able to service them to know that, you know, AI and machine learning may never make the the gap for them to actually service them as a competitive uh, advantage for them. What are your thoughts on how some of these industries who've stayed on-prem, whether it be healthcare or manufacturing or you know insurance or even some of the financial institutions, how they're using that as a defense mechanism as well for preventing maybe some of the things you're seeing in, in cyber attacks, but also just giving up all of their information to some of these larger cloud providers? You know, candidly... The short answer is I don't know. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not well versed enough to comment intelligently on it. I think though, ultimately, the that's where things are moving. Like the market's moving towards 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 cloud providers. It's very difficult now to scale a business and maintain a business on prem. You can keep the status quo, but you can't scale. Is the trade off you're really going for? And there's scale economics at play, and it's just the space is moving so quickly, right? That it's just so incredibly inefficient to try to maintain try to maintain functions on-prem, but try to maintain the kind of requisite human capital and know-how locally and internally to manage that. It's just not kind of a longer term, I think a longer term solution for for scaling businesses and and, and kind of either non-legacy businesses or businesses moving from a kind of legacy framework into a kind of more, more modern framework, which again, brings up the question of how do you, you know, where do you invest to kind of take that transition as a given? I mean, we've been talking about this transition to the cloud though for quite some time. It's still crazy again, like that we're still talking about how many companies you said 25% are still holding off or 25 have converted and 75%. 25% of application workloads are happening on the cloud. More than half are still happening on prem. Right. I, 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 so it's still going to be a conversation we're going to be having for quite some time, it feels like here. You know, one other thing I'd love to get your opinion on is uh, there's been talk on, you know, Twitter and stuff about how the relationship with venture capital and who the customers are in venture capital is starting to get a lot more airtime. You know, I've had my opinions on this and I've expressed them to you before who our short term clients are versus our long term clients. But I would love to get your take, given that you obviously do invest in venture funds, you obviously invest also with the bank, and you understand what it means to be a founder. You know, who do you think a venture fund's customers are, and how would you break them down? To me, I think there's a there's a philosophical distinction to be to be made, and and what's unique about venture capital is that it is uniquely romantic, right? Like there's an element of venture capital that is different from other asset classes that as a venture capitalist, you're not really an asset manager. You're not really, you're not really a capital allocator. You're building businesses from the ground up. And I think there's a certain partnership and camaraderie that exists between venture capitalists and the entrepreneurs that they invest in. And it's a very exciting ride. And it's one that, you know, naturally, I think gives rise to 
sort of timeless human emotions and, and, and kind of excitement, right? So I think there's an element of, you know, the venture capitalist as, you know, a fearless backer of risk-taking entrepreneurs and everything that goes with it. Now, if you, if you break it down, though, if you break it down to the actual kinetics of the whole thing, venture capital is asset management, right? It really, it really is. And, and it's arguably more about capital allocation than even something like buyout private equity, which very clear who the customer is in, 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 bio, in, in, in the buyout space. So to me, I think it, it depends on the posture you take, right? Like do you take, are you, do you lean into this kind of narrative element of venture capital as an important sort of non-financial cog in a broader, in a broader innovative system? Or do you sort of take the more practical view that at the end of the day, a venture capitalist is managing capital for third parties or entrusting them to manage that capital on their behalf. And to me, I think it's hard to make the case that you can be, you know, flippant or shoot too much from the hip when it's when it's third people's money who you're you're kind of holding in trust, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's the same way that a public market CEO has to think about their business. I mean, first off, the reason this is coming to a head now is because Dan Primack at Axios responded to the Citizens app news where he said that regular reminder that VC funds work for their limited partners, not for their portfolio companies. And then obviously the OG of venture, Fred Wilson from AVC comes out and says, that's not true. I've said this for a while now. He said it back in 2005. The entrepreneur is the customer and the LP is the shareholder. That's the only way to think about the venture capital business. And that makes sense to me. So I have a different take on it where I think that the entrepreneurs and the founders are our customers in the short term and our LPs are our customers and shareholders for the long term. Because let's face it, the money is tied up for 10 years. There's not much you can really do in between. But the day-to-day success of your founders is what ultimately leads to the success and eventual payout for your shareholders, your LPs. So uh, that's the way I would split it out. But I do think that this sort of like only do the things that you would do for your limited partners when it comes to operating as a venture fund is a really hard thing to manage because there's so much that happens that you cannot control or predict to make your founder successful and therefore their company successful. And then eventually your LP is successful. Like there's so many things. So you have to come at it from a founder first mentality of making them successful. Because if you only made the LP successful, you would do a lot of irrational things that the founders would never agree with or never understand. And I think that's where I kind of come at it from. But obviously, feel free to fright, fight me on this one. I think you're right. Like the, the other way to think about it is it's, it's a very imperfect analog, but there's this, there's a persistent question for companies like Facebook and Google of who's their customer, right? Is their customer advertisers or is their customer their end user, right? And I think, you know, one, one kind of solution to that question is that the, the end user is their product, and that their customer is is the advertiser, and it's kind of a it's kind of a crass way of putting it. I think there's a there's a there's a line to be there's a there's a connection to be made there as well, right? Like I think if you look at limited partners by and large, like again, venture capital is a very very unique asset class, and limited partners by and large aren't equipped, or are they positioned to invest in emerging technology or invest in emerging entrepreneurs? in the way that they may be equipped to do so in, in other asset classes. And venture capital is unique in that it's not, it's frankly, it's sure, it's somewhat quantitative, right? Like you, you will do kind of market sizing and you'll look at companies' growth plans and all this kind of stuff, but it's more art than science and it's always kind of very qualitative. So there's a lot of instinct there as well. So there's that element as well, is that if you're an LP investing in a venture fund, the product to some extent is access to those entrepreneurs and finding them and working with them and having exposure to kind of their dreams and what they're building. So there's another framework, I think, to apply there that's not not dissimilar to, to some other questions in the kind of advertising world. Yeah, I mean, just pulling on the same thread here, there was another uh, Twitter thread that my good friend Samir Kaji put out talking about how with LPs moving to this risk off in VC, a lot of emerging managers have to figure out their why, you know, why do they need to exist and all these questions related to it. And it really hit me because, you know, I had never really sat down to think about the why we are doing this, the why our team will succeed or our mission and what inspired me to start Ripple. So I sat down and wrote it. I wrote a blog post about it that I just put out this week. 
talking about all the answers to the why questions that Samir had positioned. And so my question to you is, why do you think uh, VC funds need to exist? And why do you think even more so, you know, emerging managers like Ripple need to exist in this ecosystem? I've said this a lot and I, I keep, I hate to harp on this and, and be a mouthpiece for the industry. Venture capital is, to some extent, all venture capital is impact investing in its own way. And the reason that's the case is because if a venture capitalist is successful, chances are there's a whole bunch of positive externalities that are created across the economy and across kind of society at large, right? So that's not the case in other asset classes. It's just, it's just not, right? So sure, venture capitalists are in the business of making money, right? They're in the business of creating value for their limited partners and themselves. But in practice, a lot of the value that they create, I would argue a majority of the value they create doesn't accrue to themselves or to, the, to their limited partners but accrues to a bunch of stakeholders around them. And so from that perspective, to me, venture capital is, an, is a necessary, critical component of a mixed economy that's predicated on some measure of innovation and is predicated on some semblance of individuals who are able to take on outsized risk and who are able to connect capital to entrepreneurs. And so without venture capital, I don't think you do have innovation because you just you can't get capital to nascent companies unless you have a framework and system in place of individuals and firms that are able to take on that risk and distribute it in a particular way while making while kind of you know making money so it's not the romantic answer it's not the you know vcs are there to kind of nurture and 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 support entrepreneurs obviously that's a that's a big part of what they do but I think whenever you have a conversation about venture capital, and we've talked about this in the kind of context of Vicky and government involvement and all that kind of stuff, um, it's really important to keep in mind that venture is very unique in that way um, and that there's an overarching societal rationale for a vibrant venture ecosystem. Yeah, I obviously agree with you. I hope that more GPs write out there why they need to exist more publicly. And I think that will give more people insight into why the grind is so hard uh, for a lot of people. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, you have money. Uh, you're obviously rich and you're just waiting for people to show up on your doorstep begging you to invest in their company. It really isn't that sexy or pretty. It's 99% of the time really fucking hard. And and yeah, there's some great outcomes that hopefully come along the way, but it's a long road. And, you know, as I mentioned before in this you know podcast, Fred Wilson from USV has been doing this for 36 years, you know, so I'm sure he didn't think he'd be doing it that long if he was that wealthy to begin with. But it's a 25 year commitment. And uh, a lot of people have to understand that it's a very hard grind to get out of that initial phase of uh, traction and then continue to keep that momentum for 25 years plus. So VC is a labor of love in a way that no other asset class is like VCs do it because they love it. And the fact that VC is sexy to lay people is a commentary on VC's ability to tell a good story. It says nothing about the job. It is brutal. It's hard. It's sales. It's grinding. It's sales. It's up at night, stress. It's a, t- it's a tough gig. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't change it for anything in the, else in the world. I love it. Uh, but I agree. It's a definite labor of love. And it's a thing that will not, if I wanted to, I could probably go back and, and work at the bank and have a much lesser stress uh, uh, day-to-day role knowing, you know, you're obviously going to continue to do well every every year, but the labor of love uh, keeps me going every day. So thanks for sharing that. And thanks for joining us in the news rundown today, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Look forward to having you back in the tank again soon. Yeah, it's fun, man. I'm sure John would be very proud. I hope so. Now let's jump into our episode with Peter Haas from Mavericks Private Equity. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Peter. Of course. Thank you for having me, Matt. Excited to be here. You know, Peter, you've been working in and around the venture uh, investing world for quite some time, I'd say over the last decade at least. And now your current role as associate partner at Mavericks Private Equity, you're obviously focused on a little bit later stage investing. But it would be great if you can give our audience a brief background on your journey into the investing world and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, so I uh, started off my career doing strategy consulting. So I did that for about three years, really enjoyed it. But Kind of the main thing I never understood was if you're so good at coming up with these strategies and kind of these five-year growth plans, why don't you actually put your name behind it, put your money behind it, put your time behind it, and ultimately kind of see it through? So when I started realizing that, started looking at different investment opportunities or kind of investing role opportunities. Uh, and then as I was talking to people, exploring different things, kept hearing kind of this name John Ruflo on the tech venture side. So 
ended up meeting with him and he actually had a role at Omer's, so one of the big pensions here in Toronto where he was working at the time, to join a group called Platform Investments. So ended up talking to him, did the interview process, got the role, spent a few, spent a few years there working with him. Uh, so it was a bit of a unique group. The mandate was slightly all over the map, uh, but spent most of my time looking at fit and tech investments. So did um, growth equity, a couple growth style deals there, a couple of venture style deals. Also spent a bunch of time working with the real estate arm within Omer's Oxford, looking at kind of prop tech deals. So did a few uh, venture deals with them there. Ultimately ended up using that group to set up the growth equity group at Omer's today, which is now existing and running and going full time. And then as that was getting set up, John ended up uh, leaving Omer's to set up Mavericks and then kind of started conversations with him then. And that's what ultimately led to joining uh, Mavericks. It's always that first meeting with John that really opens your eyes to really what the fuck goes on in this industry, right? As John probably said, you got to put your money where your mouth is. A hundred percent. Well, that's fantastic. And obviously growing up, you know, underneath John and working with him at the Omer's Growth Equity platform was obviously a great stepping start for you. But you did move over to a family office venture arm working to invest on behalf of Peter Gilgan's Mattamy Homes uh, balance sheet, correct? Yeah, correct. So spent uh, about a year and a half, two years there. And uh, it was a pretty interesting role because... At Omer's, it's all about kind of generating that return and paying off the pension liability versus at Mattamy, it had multiple mandates within that. So for those people who don't know, Peter Gill is kind of the founder CEO of Mattamy Homes, the largest uh, privately held home builder in North America. The mandate of the group that I was in was essentially to diversify the family away from just home building, but it was also to kind of help the sustainability in the world and sustainability of home building and home owners. And then also to extend that relationship with the home owner customers. So Madden has this one big transaction that never really talks to the kind of home built or the home buyer again for ever unless there's an issue on the home. So what we did was we kind of looked at a whole bunch of different businesses that fit that mandate and then kind of did a buy, build or JV approach on a whole bunch of them. Uh, so we ended up looking at a bunch of investment opportunities and acquisition opportunities, but we spent a lot of our time or majority of my time, at least actually starting some new businesses from scratch. So it was a bit of a different role from going from consulting where you make PowerPoints all day to investing, looking at businesses, actually creating something. So that was super fun. The, I'd say the, the most successful business that's still going. Uh, would be a geothermal utility that we started putting in geo exchange systems into communities so you can use electricity to heat your home versus natural gas so kind of hits that sustainability mandate gets the regular interaction with the customer and has a good kind of stable financial return for the family yeah really interesting you know to hear you go obviously from the platform team at omer is where you've you know the the mouths to feed if you will are the pension liabilities obviously that's the end state of what everyone's aiming towards. But with, you know, with Peter's uh, firm, it was a, a mixture of, it sounds like a, a bit of a family office and then also a corporate venture fund to try and do that kind of buy, build or strategic deployment of capital, which is really interesting. You don't see a lot of family office balance sheets thinking exactly that way, but it obviously it, it's been working and, and you obviously had a great time working there. Going from the pension to the family office sort of uh, corporate venture side with Mad at Me, did you have to learn a different skill set or was it sort of a, just a different approach to valuing investments? I would call it more of a different approach on the like looking at the specific investment side of it because there is more than just that financial return aspect to it. I had a bit of that Omer's when I was looking at kind of the prop tech investments because they all, all had a bit of strategic rationale for Oxford. But within the Mattamy world, there's just a whole bunch of different things you have to look at that are a lot differently. So you have to look at how can it actually interact with the broader business is it going to mess up the broader business by trying to do things like this? So you need to kind of get that balancing act. And then the creating new businesses from scratch was a completely new skill set for me. So that was going from literally we had like brainstorming business ideas and PowerPoint slides to less like sign customers up, less like go out and actually drill these boreholes, like things like that. So that was completely different. And it was a ton of fun. Yeah, I can only imagine. That's what we do every day at Ripple. So I can see how uh, your eyes light up when you talk about that part of the business. But obviously, you stayed close with John and and his setting up of Mavericks Private Equity. And you joined him as an associate partner, focusing on backing more established businesses with a bit of a private equity mindset versus the early stage venture investing. So can you share more about what that means to our listeners who obviously know John from our news rundown segments? We're growth equity investors. 
again, that can mean a whole bunch of things to different people. But to us, what it really means is that we're all about investing in companies that have truly found product market fit. So if you think about kind of more venture investing, you're taking a lot of product risks, especially at the earlier stages. It's, is this product going to work? Do you believe in this team? Are they going after a big market? Versus what we like to look at is we found a product that we really think works. The people or the founders could have spent two years coming up with that. They could have spent 15 years coming up with that until they truly actually found the product market fit. But that's what we like to invest in. So we don't want to take that core product risk. We want to take a scaling risk. And uh, scaling risk truly means like when we put capital into a business, it usually goes into marketing and going to hiring for sales, sales staff, uh, entering a new geography, acquiring a competitor, things like that. Uh, so that's slightly different or it is different than when you look at kind of the venture investments where it's like, do you believe this team can truly solve that problem? Yeah. And risk is what's happening right now in the market. So like scaling risk uh, was obviously taken for granted, I think probably a year or two ago, but now it's been taken a lot more seriously, isn't it? Oh, a hundred percent, especially when you could continually just raise money at a higher and higher and higher valuation and not actually have to worry about how much it costs to scale. Truly, yeah, it was definitely taken for granted before. and It's a bit different now. Yeah. I mean, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I mean, you recently put out an article uh, published online entitled Raising Capital in Turbulent Turbulent Times and how as founders, you need to protect yourselves from getting screwed. So, you know, that's awesome. Thank you very much for putting that out. I love when people write these types of like transparent, authentic articles, but we want to talk about some of the specifics here and some of those, you know, horror stories that you obviously see a lot of people talk about after the fact. You don't really see a lot of people sharing them during the actual getting fucked over kind of uh, experience. Uh, and so I want to talk about this uh, with you specifically. So let's double click on a couple of things that you touched on in this article. First off, can you talk about, you know, the word structured financing uh, at the beginning of the article, which obviously a lot of our listeners might be aware of, but for those who don't, can you give us a brief overview on what a structured financing is and how they often look to founders? Yeah. So structured financing, again, in the different worlds means different things. But in our world and what it's going to look like to founders is any deal that's more than a simple non-participating preferred share or a common share deal. The goal of it from the investor standpoint generally is to kind of protect downside and maximize upside. But the way founders are truly going to see it when it shows up in term sheets uh, and when they actually see it is going to be uh, through usually participating preferred shares um, or through liquidation preferences. And we'll we'll jump into details on what those mean later. But the main point of that for me would be if you ever do see that in a term sheet, you really actually need to understand what that means and specifically what that's going to mean for you upon an exit. Uh, just because up front, you might not actually see what that means or what that means on the cap table, but you're definitely going to notice it down the line. And making sure there's transparency and everyone understands is key. Yeah. I mean, term sheets uh, used to be one pages <laughs> when everything was uh, going fast and heavy. Uh, and now they become like, you know, 17 pages because there's just so many structured terms in them. But let's bring it back to the basics. You know, let's talk about some examples of what a founder might encounter in these sort of term sheets, which, you know, are very simple, but also very complicated. Things like primary capital versus secondary capital or pre-money versus post-money. Can we talk about some of the nuances around like the fully diluted valuation versus the ESOP top-ups? Let's get into some specific examples that you would share with uh, founders on what things to look out for on the very first couple pages of a term sheet. Yeah, so the first place you're going to start is with the pre-money and the post-money. So the pre-money is it's the value of the company before any investment. Post-money is the value of the company after the investment. So it'd be and after the investment, I mean any cash going into the business. Uh, so if the company pre-money is 75 mil, cash going into the business is 25 mil, post-money is 100 mil. The way that's always calculated is on a fully diluted basis. Uh, so what that means is it's essentially what the cap table is going to look like if all outstanding stock of the company, including any kind of options or warrants or convertible debt, is actually taken up and converted. And the reason that's important to know is because upon exit, if it goes well, and in some scenarios, even if it doesn't go well, all of those kind of convertible pieces are going to be, will be exercised and converted. So that impacts the actual eventual ownership that 
current shareholders or investors will own. So that's why I've been talking about kind of the valuations on a pre-money basis. Everyone always looks at kind of what is the fully diluted basis there. Yeah. And also for existing investors in the company, they come in at the post money, but they get marked at the pre-money of the new round. And so there's always so understanding of those things for the existing stakeholders in the business. But also, uh, let's talk a little bit about sort of the things that get in between the pre-money and the post-money, which are ESOP top-ups or, you know, taking debt off of the post-money valuation. Can you give us some examples of what new investors are usually asking for when it comes to like ESOP and then pre and post with or without some of the convertible debt or other venture debt products out there? The overall thing to understand here is that all of these terms kind of change how much people are going to own in the company upon exit. So it's all kind of comes down to the current valuation. So if you look at the ESOP, you can either have it put into the pre or post money. The pre money ESOP essentially means that it's the existing shareholders that get diluted by the amount of the ESOP. And on the post money, if you put it into the post money, it means everyone. So it'll be existing shareholders plus future shareholders that are going to get diluted by it. It doesn't make a big difference, but it can make a difference on how much you get diluted as kind of the existing shareholders. Uh, so the whole idea of the ESOP is to give more incentive to the employees. And usually everyone wants to have that add in. So existing shareholders will want it. Founders will want it. New investors will want it. So kind of those employees can be incentivized because it's a key part of compensation at kind of growing tech companies. So the way it works is that you can either have the dilution go into the pre money or the post money. And essentially what that means is if it goes into the pre money, it is the existing shareholders that get diluted. And if you go into the post money, it is the existing plus the new investors that will get diluted by the size of the ESOP. Right. Which is rare. I mean, you don't see it go into the post money very often unless it's a very competitive process. Yeah, I agree. It normally goes into the pre-money. So quick example about how this works. If we do a pre-money of 75 mil, company raises 25 mil, they want to add a 10% option pool. If we go through the pre-money option, uh, it's a $75 million pre-money. Post is going to be 100. 10% of that means you want a 10 million of that to be the option pool. So you take the pre-money of 75, you minus out the 10, and that ends up being your option pool. So the pre-money is essentially 65 million for the existing shareholders. You have that 10 million for the option, then 25 million for the new investors going in. So existing shareholders end up owning 65% of the company post investment. Uh, and then if you want to put the ESOP into the post money, if the calculation's a bit harder, you need to turn on the iterative part of your, uh, your Excel. But what essentially happens is you have the 75 million pre money. 100 mil post money, and then you want to have your 10% option pool. Uh, so you end, end up having to do about 11 million of option pool. So the post money actually increases by that amount, and you end up having about 111 post money. So you end up having the 10% option pool, it's about 22% uh, for the new investor, and about 68% for the found for the existing investors. So you have about a 3% delta on ownership stake for the existing investors in there. Yeah. And this is why, you know, uh, it's really hard for existing investors to know their exact, you know, return on investment going through the journey of a business, because there's so many nuances to where the dollars get added up and the percentage points come off of or get added to. So I always find it interesting, like when we have our rolling projections on our portfolio performance, it always has to be off by a couple decimal points just because of all these nuances. But let's get into the juicy stuff, which is obviously the liquidation preferences and the capital stack of these businesses upon a liquidation and all that good shit that founders should be caring about, especially in these markets. So most people have heard of the common shares, which are typically what founders and employees own versus the preferred shares, which is what investors or capital providers own. But can you explain how the preferred shares get treated in a liquidation scenario and the different types of preferred shares, like simple, non-participating, or for God's sake, participating preferred shares in this world? 
The first thing to understand is just the different types of the preferred shares that you walk through. The most common and what we always suggest using would be a simple preferred. Other Sometimes it's also called non-participating preferred or no participation. And the way this works is that investors have two options upon exit. So they can either elect to receive their liquidation preference or they can elect to convert their shares into common shares which is usually at kind of a one for one ratio, but you can also negotiate that to change. One for one is definitely market. For definition sakes, the liquidation preference, that again can be a negotiation piece and is a negotiation piece. But what it usually means is the amount that the investors paid in for their shares. So if you paid $10 for your share, usually your liquidation is 10. It's just your paid in capital. But what some investors will do is they'll negotiate that to have multiples associated with it. So you can have a, a 2x on that 10 or a 3x or a 4x. And that's kind of where the structuring can get confusing. And as a founder or existing shareholder, you don't necessarily see that or notice it or care about it up front because it actually doesn't show up in your cap table. It just looks like you still own the same percentage. But upon exit, it can make quite a substantial difference. So the liquidation preference, instead of them getting 10% of the company, they could get a 10x on that original investment, and then you as an existing share could actually get nothing. So there's a balance there that needs to be thought of, and it's definitely not market to be having these max, massive liquidation preferences, but people are doing it today. Right. So it's the waterfall that we all talk about that you want to see actually start to fall towards you if you're at the bottom of the stack versus capturing as much of that value on a liquidation if you have those liquidity preferences. But let's talk about the the, the evil one of all, which is the participating prep. What does that mean? So participating prep, people call it full participation, fully participating prep. So keep an eye out for all that language. But what it means is that instead of having the option of taking your liquidation preference or converting into the common stock, you get your liquidation preference and you get a share of everything else that comes, all the money that comes into the business on a sale as if you were converted into common shares. So you're kind of double dipping. So you get that liquidation preference of could be your paid in capital, could be a multiple. And then you also, once you get that, if you own 10% of the company, you share in 10% of all the other proceeds that come from it. So it really is a double dip. And again, if you don't calculate that waterfall and really show what it's going to look like upon exit, it could really mask kind of the true economics of it. Could not recommend founders more to kind of do that calculation and look at what it's going to look like because it can make a major difference. So let's go through an example back to that 25, 75 pre post money, 100 million, and investors, let's say, own 25% and founders own 75. Walk us through an example of what this looks like when the company does have a liquidation several years later. Yeah, 100%. So the other point to point out here is sometimes you'll have coupons or cumulative dividends associated with these shares. It can be on the simple PREF or it can be on the fully participating PREFs. Uh, it's usually considered kind of like a debt piece. Uh, so it's usually 6 or 8% and it can be accumulated on top of that. So we can also add that into the calculation. So for example, $75 million pre-money, $25 million raise, $100 million post. Uh, we can go through two scenarios. So we can go through a $50 million exit, a $300 million exit. So... If you're a, a simple preferred share, assuming there's no coupon to make the math easy, a $50 million exit, the investor put in 25 mil, they have the option to convert into common or they have the option to get their liquidation preference, which is usually the paid in capital. So we'll assume it's the paid in capital in this case. So the investor will always pick whichever one gets them the highest value because that's the jobs. So they'll take the 25 million and then the existing shareholders before the investment or the founders will get 25 million. So 50, 50 each there. And then if you look at a $300 million exit, the investor is going to decide to convert into common shares because they'll get more money than the 25 mil. So for their 25% ownership stake, they'll get 75 mil founders for their 75% ownership stake. will get 225 mil. So, Obviously, a much better outcome. It's a good scenario for everyone. Everyone did well. So that's kind of the simple preferred, most common kind of structure and what we always suggest everyone does. So now let's play it out in the participating side. 
Yeah, so if we look into a participating preferred, again, we'll assume a one-time liquidation preference, so just paying capital and no coupon. In a $50 million scenario, the investor is going to get their 25 mil, and then they still own 25% of the business. So on the next 25 million that's coming in, they're going to get another 25% of that. So the investor ends up getting 31 million of the 50, and then the founders end up with 19. So the deltas in the previous scenario is 25 mil to 31 for the investor and 25 mil to 19 for the founders or previous investors. So that can make a pretty substantial difference, especially on the downside. And then if you look at a $300 million exit, again, makes a pretty big difference. Not as bad for the founders because there was a positive exit. So of a $300 million exit, the investor will again get their 25 mil again. And then since they own 25% of the company, they'll then get 25% of the remaining 275 million. And that will split evenly between them and the founders. So the investors will get 94 million compared to 75 million for simple pref. And then the founders will get 206 million compared to 225 in the simple pref. So again, on the upside, it still makes a difference, but not as big of a difference, but it's really these downside scenarios where the founders can go from doing well and participating to getting screwed pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. These small words and terms that don't seem very material today can have a huge difference down the road for founders. So how should founders manage all these transactions and think about how to you know, understand the different incentives for various stakeholders and investors when discussing these terms and structures for the next round of funding? So if you look at kind of the decision makers within a company, uh, especially at the board level, the two main ones are really the founders and the existing investors. And both actually have different incentives here. As a founder, you might be interested in kind of keeping that structure or doing something structured so you can keep for a couple of reasons. So one would be, could be for ego. So it could be because you announced a previous funding valuation. You want to kind of keep saying you're at that high valuation or you want to announce that you're at a higher valuation. So you're willing to kind of take some of the structure to do that. Um, another concern when we've talked to founders is for employee morale. So if employees have gotten options at a previous valuation, and then they hear that those options are now 50% underwater and not really worth as much because you had to do a down ramp, it can have some impact on them. But what we always recommend within there is to either, you, you need to readjust the, the option pool. What that either means is adding to the option pool, re-giving them to employees, or repricing the existing options so those employees can still get their incentives uh, because employees are the lifeblood of all our companies that we look at. That's how we would suggest working through those scenarios. And then the other important stakeholder, as I mentioned, is really the existing investors. And what's important to understand is actually how investment funds work. So you can kind of get in the mindset of why existing investors would want some structure in certain scenarios. So the way kind of venture funds and most funds work is it's usually a 10 year fund life. You then have kind of two to four years in most scenarios you spend actually investing that capital you raised. And then once you've invested that capital, you go out and raise another fund and then you continue to manage your existing investments, but you go raise another fund to continue to make new investments. So when you're going to actually raise that fund, because you just made all of your existing investments and because it takes a long time to know whether your investments are doing well or not, you actually don't know what the ultimate performance of the fund is going to be. But you look for kind of proof points to help convince new investors or existing investors to come into your fund. And one of those proof points is showing the unrealized returns of the fund. As a fund manager or as a new investor coming into the fund, you'll look at every single investment one by one. And then you'll mark what you think the current valuation of those investments is. And then you can show what your funds return to date. And it's usually your unrealized fund return because you haven't actually sold any of those stakes yet. There's no actually cash coming back into the bank. One of the key ways that people will do that kind of market valuation is essentially looking at what the previous, the most recent round raised by the fund, by the existing company was and kind of looking at that share price and marking it against what they just or what they invested in that company at. 
So what ends up happening is that if I invested a company and my stock was worth $2 when I did, they then raised the $4, I can show that I have a hundred percent markup on that. And it can make my fund look good, which makes me be able to raise capital easier when I go out and raise my second fund or my next fund. However, if the company has a down round and raises that a dollar instead of two, it shows that I'm down 50% on my investment. So what this ultimately means is that if VCs or existing investors are able to kind of keep that higher stock price, they can show higher unrealized returns and it makes it easier for them to raise their next fund. This is kind of where the main issue and kind of difference between founders and investors can come up. A lot of times when we talk to founders about this, they're like, what are you talking about? They're board members. They have a fiduciary duty to the board. But we can talk about this another time. But when you actually look through a lot of the key like governance matters or decision matters, you can actually carve those out to be shareholder rights or shareholder votes versus board rights and board votes. So if it's a shareholder vote, you can actually act in what's your best interest and not the overall company's best interest. So that also helps, doesn't help, but it creates additional conflict on how people can act as well. Yeah, knowing what people are motivated by uh, when a lot of these sort of scenarios play out is important for all stakeholders. But what you're basically saying is that obviously venture funds like ourselves don't want to see markdowns. And so we'll do a you know cap convertible note extension. But in the terms, there's going to have some of these you know structured financing terms in there that don't show up in any sort of material as well that could benefit the individual investor and may potentially help or hurt the rest of the stakeholders of the business that they are on the board of as a director, which is obviously happening a lot in these markets. You know, one thing that we have been seeing some of our founders do to protect them and all the other stakeholders from these scenarios is let's say they have two term sheets. One is for 25 million investment on a hundred million posts in your example, but it comes with all these, you know, onerous terms. A lot of these founders are taking the uh, lesser dilution, lower valuation, but cleaner term sheet because they know how it will play out for them in the end. So instead of raising 25, they'll raise 15 uh, and they'll do it on probably a a little bit slower or lower pre-money, but overall the terms are much cleaner and safer for everyone involved. If you have that luxury, obviously, uh, it'd be best of interest to take that uh, is what we're recommending our founders do. But obviously, if you're in a very sticky situation and you need whatever capital bridge financing you can just to stay alive, you do what you can to stay alive, right? Yeah, 100%. Couldn't couldn't recommend that more. If there's ways to raise a smaller amount, if it's a cleaner term sheet, always would do that. Um, The other thing we've been seeing a lot of is companies raising some type of convertible. So it's kind of kicking the valuation can down the road. So it's instead of pricing it today, they'll raise a smaller amount, usually so another six months. And then it'll be at like, a, for example, 25, 30% discount when the next fundraising happens. So we've seen a lot of that taking place in the market too, but the cleaner you can make your terms, it's frankly the better for everyone in the long term. Right. And so at Mavericks, you know, what are you guys doing to stay aligned and keep things simple as we've discussed here today to help founders with repricing of options, granting more options, keeping their, you know, the the down round scenario as clean uh, and effective as possible. What are you guys trying to do at your side? There's a couple examples of this that I can walk through. So one would be we were talking to this company. Valuation was clearly down, call it 75 percent from where they last raised. Kind of everyone was on the same page of that. But what really happened was that if they were going to raise at that lower valuation, which they ended up doing, not with us, but with a different firm, they had to get repriced for everyone. So basically management ended up not owning nearly as much as the business because they were kind of the bottom of the capital stack, especially when you have these kind of liquidation preferences stacked on top of you. The founder could actually be essentially working for free for the next kind of five years because they have to build that value back up before you can pay that all off. So what we've been suggesting to founders to do is do a clean term sheet, get kind of a simple preferred share, do a real market valuation. So everyone's on the same page. We can kind of start from scratch here. And then what you need to do is create a new option pool. Uh, You can actually place that option pool above some of what Uh, previous investors came into if you need to. So you're not buried behind that kind of capital stack again. And then you need to re-up management on options. 
you need to re-up employees and options, and you need to kind of keep everyone excited and incentivized to keep building a great business because that's ultimately what we're all here for. Yeah, I mean, so in that scenario, which is a recapitalization, as we call it, down 75% from the last valuation, can you give us an example of like what kind of an ESOP brand you were considering doing? Would it be of like 15, 25% ESOP top up? Yeah, so that specific scenario, we were at 15%, I believe, with a very good chunk of that going to kind of the key founders to make sure everyone was re-incentivized because they're the key people. Yeah. I mean, founder flight is a huge risk all the time, but in these scenarios, when you're doing a big recapitalization, essentially wiping out existing commons and slashing, you know, existing prefs off at the knees, you need to do something for the people who are actually operating the business while still minimizing downside for new capital coming into the business, taking a risk at this juncture, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. So another example would be, we were talking to a company, um, well-known company here that has a pretty high valuation. The founder basically realized that he raised at way too high of a valuation company was worth way less but they still have a whole bunch of cash on the balance sheet so the existing investors didn't want to do kind of a recap and re-up him and figure it all out so what ultimately ended up happening is that he was like i want to try out this new idea existing investors in this in my current business don't want to allocate capital to this existing idea because we're now in a world where we're not growing at all costs. We now need to get the kind of cash flow break even and we're operating the business differently. And he was like, and I'm buried behind this huge preferred stack. So without doing the recapitalization, I'm going to leave and actually set up this new business and go after this new idea. So we are seeing examples of founder flight risk actually playing out, which as an investor, you never want to see. Yeah. And have you seen anyone who has been asked to return preferred capital rather than just like letting it dwindle down for a business that's worth 75% less now just to kind of get it over with? Because we look at kind of doing new deals and putting in new capital into businesses, I actually have not run into that yet on deals we're specifically working on. I have heard of people ask to do that, uh, but so far haven't actually seen it take place. Wouldn't be surprised at all if it did at some point though. Yeah. I mean, all the case studies that you read through business school and all the textbook stuff you you hear about, uh, it's actually starting to play out a little bit now, which is interesting. And for people uh, just starting off their career, it's a great learning experience on what happens during tur- turbulent times to learn how to kind of thread the needle to come out the other side, hopefully unscathed. But uh, I really appreciate you sharing all these thoughts and recommendations with us, uh, Peter. You know, before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their uh, fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. Uh, lately, it's been acquired. Nice. Did you listen to the uh, new NFL one? I have not yet. The I think the most recent one I listened to was the Qualcomm one, and it was really good. Qualcomm was good, too. Those guys are fantastic. Uh, I'll let you know when I record eight hours for one episode. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. My favorite, two would be Noah Smith, uh, No Opinion, and then News Items by uh, John L. Oh, nice one. And uh, your favorite tech gadget? The AirPods. Yep. Always a classic here. And uh, next, your favorite new trend? My favorite one that not necessarily new, but that I spent a lot of time on is anything to do with kind of rockets and space travel and kind of looking at that world. Do you have like a big like model rocket in your uh, in your office or bedroom? Oh, I wish. I need to get one. <laughs> the uh, Rose Rocket, one of our companies has them all over the office. It's, the whole office is named after different rocket ships. It's oh, that's funny. awesome. Uh, next is your favorite book? Most recently would be e-boys which is actually a very old book it's about benchmark through the last bubble i found it on my dad's bookshelf the other day and gave it a read and then uh yeah so that was a fun one especially because it's so it's basically about the 2000 or it's written during the 2000 bubble so there's a ton of parallels to kind of what's going on today nice and last but not least your favorite life lesson uh, my favorite one would be the quote the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones and it's to me, that's all about kind of if you want to do big things, you just need to start somewhere and just get moving. And you might seem like you're not getting there, but as you continually do those small things, it adds up. That's fantastic. That's like my father-in-law says, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah, exactly. Thanks so much for joining us in the tank today, Peter from Mavericks Private Equity. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Matt. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. 
and hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Maddie B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 